Good day, my name is Boon, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present today. As some of you may know me, I was the past organizing chair for last year's SYTA at Kuala Lumpur in 2020, working along with Sandeep, who was a co-founder for this SYTA. I congratulate Sandeep for persisting in organizing SYTA for the second time and his team for making this event a successful one now in New Delhi, India. The topic of my presentation is related to underground tunneling solutions for impact assessments, mainly in salt, and the use of distinct element method to study rock reinforced mechanisms in jointed rock. I'd like to begin the presentation with this slide. Goats and sheep. Although they sound very similar, but they are actually very different. Sheep are more obedient and easier to maintain, whereas goats are more mischievous and harder to predict. And in our engineering problems, many of them behave like sheep, which follow standard solutions, whereas some problems are more complicated and have their own characteristics or personalities in a figurative manner. And we as engineers must be careful to distinguish them in practice. I hope this image will be a reminder in the subsequent slides. This is the content of the presentation. The first three parts are related to building impact assessments and finally we will have a short discussion on the influence of geology or geological sequence on the rock reinforcement mechanism. Imagine that you were an engineer and you had to assess the impact of settlements to masonry buildings and there were no solutions available during your period. And based on first principles, Berlin and Roth developed a method. They assumed that the building could be simplified into a thick beam. And depending on the geometry of the building, based on its length to height ratio, either the bending mode or the shearing mode would be governing. The settlement would induce deflection, which would cause tensile cracks. For the case of bending, the cracks would appear as vertical cracks. And for the case of shearing, it would appear as diagonal cracks. These two images are consistent with what we've discussed earlier. On the left, you have a vertical tensile crack at the masonry wall at the balcony. And as the opening of the crack is largest at the top of the wall, this is largely due to a hogging mode of bending. And on the right, you have a diagonal crack happening across the building. And this is subject to a shearing mode of deformation. Although these two crack patterns are consistent with what we've discussed earlier theoretically. The reasons for ground settlements inducing such cracks have not been discussed. And I believe, my friends, this is for you to carry out careful planning of site investigations of the ground. Well, as engineers, we have to check for both mechanisms, both shearing induced strains and bending induced strains. The ground movement induced by tunneling is a vector which points towards the tunnel as a sink source. In other words, the ground movement vector consists of horizontal movement and also vertical settlement. The vertical settlement is the component which induces deflection to the structure which was discussed earlier. And for the case of bending mode deformation, 
the horizontal strain and bending strains could be added based on the principle of superposition. Whereas for diagonal strains, we will have to rely on more circles. Well, the horizontal strains on one side of the face could be plotted and the perpendicular side is merely a function of the Poisson's effect and from this the radius of the circle could be established and we could work out what is the maximum strain. Depending on where the building is located along the settlement trough induced by tunneling, the building could be either sagging or hogging and this also affects the position of the neutral axis in the calculation. You could calculate the impact of ground settlements to a building using the Berlin and Roth tensile strain approach using BATS, a cloud-based program, and the link is given at the bottom of this page. With BATS, you will be able to generate the settlement troughs for a pair of twin tunnels and estimate the magnitude of settlement. You will also be able to generate damage charts as shown in the right. You will have a chart for the hogging zone and a different chart for a sagging zone. And both bending and shearing modes of deformations are being checked. So as you can see in this graph, different combinations of horizontal strains and deflection ratio can lead to the same magnitude of tensile strain and this is being drawn as contour lines. The contour lines were based on values proposed by Berlin and Rolf. As you can see in this slide, the damage category has been defined based on the magnitudes of tensile strains and typically for damage categories moderate and worse, there is a need to carry out more detailed assessment. Now, in order to understand the impact of tunneling on structures with deep foundation, we will need to understand the axial response of the piles subject to settlement. In order to understand the pile response to tunneling, we must understand the subsurface settlement trough patterns. From the settlement trough at the ground surface, it gets deeper and narrower closer to the tunnel, which is normally referred to as the sink source. The maximum settlement increases with that at the center line of the tunnel. Now imagine you had to tunnel below a bridge structure and there are different piers located relative to your tunnel position. This is a simplified finite element analysis of the greenfield soil settlement around the tunnels. In the middle, the soil settlement trend is increasing with depth as shown in the blue crosses as what I've discussed earlier. And as you get away from the center, the soil settlement actually decreases with depth because the subsurface settlement trough becomes narrower. In other words, you could actually break down the soil movement into two components, shaded in grey and shaded in yellow. The grey movement is actually the on-block movement of the soil from the ground surface to the power toll level. And the yellow is the relative movement of the soil at the power head and the, at the power toll. And depending where you are, the relative settlement could be increasing with depth or decreasing with depth.
after knowing the soil settlement trends along the path, the relationship is then governed by the frictional properties at the power interface with the soil and the end bearing properties. And this is normally known as the load transfer analysis. In order to establish the spring stiffness of the shaft and the end bearing, there are a few ways, and I shall not discuss them in detail. And you could refer to the manuscript to get an idea of how this could be done. Let us start with a simplified problem with three powers. One power is completely within the influence zone and as we know the soil settlements would be completely increasing with depth and two other powers are located partially within and partially outside the influence zone drawn by this dashed line. This is Paris, another cloud-based program. You could use Paris to calculate the influence of ground settlements on the axial response of a pile. On the top left figure shows the ground settlement along the pile body with depth from the ground level to 20 meters below ground. And on the lower figures are the axial load distribution curves of the pile. At the working load, the original axial load distribution is shown in a black line and due to tunneling as the soil around the pile settles there's loss in mobilized resistance which results in the blue line and in order for the pile to recover the working load at the pile head due to the imposed load the pile will need to settle to recompress or remobilize the shaft and end bearing resistance and finally, the red line is obtained post tunneling. For the power closest to the tunnel, the ground settlement is increasing with that as shown in the green triangles in the top left figure. As the ground settlement at the power toe is greater, there is loss in mobilized end bearing as shown in the load distribution curve on the lower left. And for the power to regain the mobilized resistance, the power would settle and recover the mobilized resistance mainly through the shaft. The power settles about 12 millimeters, and this is the largest compared to the three cases. The reason is that a soil settlement trend which, de which increases with depth suggests that the relative movement along this, between the soil and the pile is significant and much of the resistance or mobilized resistance would have been lost. On the other hand, for the pile located furthest from the tunnel, whose ground settlement is shown in the red squares on the top left figure, the soil settlement is increasing with depth and decays with depth. In this case, the end bearing is not much lost as shown in the lower right figure. And in order for the pile to recover the working load after tunneling, the pile would rely more on the end bearing than the shaft due to the relative displacement of the soil and the power body. And the settlement of the power is about 6 millimeters based on the frictional spring stiffness or the assigned to the shaft and the end bearing spring stiffness. The earlier results are consistent with centrifuge tests where the axial load distribution of the pile before and after tunneling depends largely on the relative position of the pile in relation to the tunnel. Depending on the stiffness of the building, 
and the magnitude of ground settlement, the loads or reactions in the building frame may get redistributed. This is just an example of how one could work this out based on Castellano's theorem. However, these are details and there are many ways to get to the same answer using structural software. Now, imagine you experience settlement at one end of your structure. If your structure is able to settle together with the ground, you recover the reaction. However, this can normally happen for determinate structures. Otherwise, cracks will develop in your structure depending on the magnitude of settlement. On the other hand, for st stiff structures, the structure may not settle together with the ground and the ground settlement would result in an unloading of the reaction support. Due to force equilibrium in the vertical direction, the neighbouring support will need to take more load. This is re the reason why it is important to assess the current condition of the structure and to identify whether the structure is in a dilapidated state because the structure may not be able to accommodate the load redistribution well. It is also important to identify the structural connection to the neighbouring structural member and the structural member sizes if they are undersized. And this is a relatively difficult problem which relies heavily on the lapidation survey and site visits. Now let's move on to some rock mechanics. I will show you the influence of geology and geological sequence to the rock reinforcement mechanism. In a jointed rock, the fractures cut up the intact rock into pieces and this could be simplified into polygons or polyhedrons. As you can see here in this image, this is a real example of the reproducing of fracture geometry based on the mapped fracture orientation at the site as shown in the figure on the right. Based on the typical fracture orientation, you would be able to establish a few scenarios from the distinct element analysis with different fracture intensity. Depending on the block size, you will get different rock bolt forces and the mechanism of failure becomes different. As you can see in the figure on the lower right, you get removable rock wages shaded in purple and the rock bolt forces which support these wages experience larger forces by comparison to other rock bolts. It is important to provide enough anchorage beyond the wages to ensure that these are being secured. Whereas for small lock size, the rock bolt forces increases because of the decay of stiffness around the opening and also due to the degree of freedom increasing. For underground works, you would be interested to know the influence of fracture intensity and rock joint friction angle on the rock bolt forces. In the figure on the left, you can see that for smaller block size, the rock bolt forces increases around the opening. And in the figure on the right, the result of different rock joint friction angle is being plotted. For 
lower rock joint friction angle, the rock bolt forces is being mobilized more and the rock bolt has to work harder. This shows that the distinct element is a relatively flexible tool to address the engineer's questions and can be more direct compared to empirical classifications. Wow, such beautiful scenery. This is another problem which I'd like to share and it's related to joint rock with sub-horizontal bedings. I was inspired in a visit to Barcelona, Spain when I saw the change in geological sequence of the rock outcrop along the highway on the way to Mount Mozart. For thick horizontal beddings, the bedding would be able to arch across the opening into the abutment. And in this case, the rock boat forces at the roof decay with distance, and the governing forces are the separation between the beddings. On the other hand, for rock boats which are installed at the abutment across the vertical fractures, it will be resisting the vertical shear displacement and the mechanism is slightly different. For thinner bedings, the rock layer is no longer self-supporting. Now the rock reinforcement mechanism is based on beam building. For stiff beddings, the rock reinforcement increases and then decreases with distance as shown in the figure on the left. For more compliant beddings, the deflection of the beam is larger and the rock bolt forces would also be more inclined, indicating that there is shearing along the beddings as shown in the figure on the right. Also, you can see that the gap develops between the stiff stratum and the compliant stratum in the figure on the lower left. Going back to the Barcelona outcrop, this shows that the classical theory of suspension, working out the dead weight of the loose material, actually could be reproduced in a distinct element model. So the thin beddings are actually suspending off the rock bolt, which are anchored into the stiffer stratum. And the loads could be calculated based on the dead weight of the material in the thin beddings. Finally, we reach the end of the presentation. And I'd like all of you to recall what was presented in the first slide of the presentation. What are the goals? And what are the seats? Could you type in the chat box? In my opinion, the solutions that I've presented to help you with your desk studies in the office are ships. And it is for you to find the goats from your site visits and careful site investigations and detailed their studies. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>